I'm John Banther. Welcome to Classical Breakdown. It's the last episode of season two before we take a summer break. I want to thank everyone for listening and sharing the podcast. If you've enjoyed listening and learning about classical music, please leave us a five-star review in your podcast app. That helps in getting the podcast in front of other listeners like you. I want to thank not just you for listening, but all of my co-hosts this season, and also Classical WETA's Evan Keeley, who assisted me with music. Everyone really came together to make the podcast work while never even being in the same room. Looking back on the last season, highlights for me would be episode 29, The Life of Tchaikovsky, one of my favorite composers. Also episode 30, which goes into Beethoven's monumental Fifth Symphony, and of course all of the episodes featuring musicians from the National Symphony Orchestra. In our final episode of the season, I'd like to continue the trend we started last year, recommending some new recordings to listen to this summer and expand your musical palette. You can go to the show notes page at classicalweta.org after the episode to find out where you can listen or purchase these albums for yourself. So let's start with a brand new and debut recording of violinist Randall Gooseby, who studied with Itzhak Perlman at Juilliard for his bachelor and master's degrees. He's only 24 years old, but has already appeared with the Cleveland Orchestra and the New York Philharmonic. His debut album is called Roots and is comprised mostly of music by black composers. In the liner notes, he writes, Many of these African-American composers, William Grant Still, Florence Price, Coleridge Taylor Perkinson, had to navigate this industry at a time when racism, prejudice, and segregation were commonplace. Today, artists like myself and other young artists of color enjoy more of a sense of freedom and confidence in pursuing a life in classical music. If it weren't for these composers, these artists, and this music, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing today. This recording is a tribute to their lives and experiences and their dedication to creating this art that we all love. Now, I love this album. It has a variety of musical styles, different ensemble configurations, world premiere recordings, and his playing is extraordinary. The album starts with a bluegrass and R&B-inspired work called Shelter Island by bassist Xavier Dubois Foley, actually a colleague of Gooseby's, and it just hooks you in right from the beginning. Then it's a work for solo violin by Coleridge Taylor Perkinson called Blues Forms for Solo Violin. It's really difficult to write a multi-movement work for a solo instrument. It's so easy for the sound to wander, to fall flat, to lose momentum, and not really fill up a space. None of that happens here, and Gooseby carries the work through from beginning to end with not just great uh, musicality and technique, but also really great intonation. Difficult intervals that many might fudge a bit are easily achieved in Gooseby's hands. Gerald M. Jackson, who wrote the liner notes for the album, says, Gooseby included works by two non-black composers, Antonin Dvorak and George Gershwin, because of the admiration and respect they showed for African American and Native American people during their time. On this album, there's Gershwin. We hear selections from Porgy and Bess, including Summertime, A Woman is a Sometimes Thing, and Ain't Necessarily So, and Bess, You Is My Woman Now. After this, he moves to pretty substantial works by William Grant Still, Florence Price, and Samuel Coleridge Taylor. Still's suite for violin and piano was inspired by sculptures from the Harlem Renaissance. And the second movement, Mother and Child, which is sometimes used as the name of the suite, it is especially touching. I really like the Florence Price works that Gooseby included here on the album. 
They're also world premiere recordings. We have Adoration and then Two Fantasies. And if you haven't already, listen to episode 38, The Life of Florence Price. You can really hear all the things that Dr. Karen Walden was talking about in regards to Price's voice. I don't want to spoil these world premiere recordings too much, so give them a listen, as I think we'll be hearing more of them in concerts as we get back to live performances. After a playing of Deep River by Samuel Coleridge Taylor, Gooseby ends the album and ties it all together with a sonatina by Dvorak. I hope you enjoyed this one as much as I did. It's really nice to find a new album that has many different works across different styles and ensemble configurations that just flows from beginning to end. Now let's go to a new album for solo piano featuring Simona Dinnerstein. It's called An American Mosaic, the same name of the main work on the album by Richard Daniel Poor, and it's a reflection on the pandemic. I know many of us are looking to move forward from this past year, but I think this one is really worth listening to, not just on its musical merit alone, but as we try to process everything that happened in this last year, which will probably take us years. The story behind this album, for me, is just as important as the music itself. In the liner notes, Daniel Poor, the composer, writes, In April 2020, during the first wave of the COVID pandemic in America, I was informed by my pulmonologist that because of my asthma, my chances of surviving COVID-19 were about 30% if I were to contract the virus. I barely slept that month. The only thing that was able to relax me enough to sleep was listening to Simona Dinnerstein's Bach recordings. Later in May, having witnessed the extraordinary heroism of so many valiant Americans who had struggled to combat this invisible enemy, which was the coronavirus, I thought it fitting at some point to compose a 15-movement cycle for solo piano that would be live-streamed by the end of 2020. At that moment, I knew that the end of 2020 would be a challenging and terrible time in America, and my hope was that I could write a work that would somehow give comfort to those who had suffered and struggled through this unprecedented crisis. First, I think Daniel Poor's experience with the music of Bach in the early months of the pandemic were shared by many people, myself included. There was just something about Bach that offered some sense of stability and solace. So it's perfect that this album actually ends with a few Bach piano arrangements made by Daniel Poor. The work he wrote is called An American Mosaic and features four consolations or interludes evenly spaced between movements that reflect different people and roles in society, like parents and children, which is playful, heavy, and nervous all at the same time. and it shares similarities with another movement called Teachers and Students. Other movements are rabbis and ministers, journalists, poets and writers, doctors and interns, and so on. The entire work is about 50 minutes long, and Daniel Poor composed it entirely while confined in his apartment, Dinnerstein said. He was very sequestered when he wrote this. I think there's a different kind of privacy to this music, an intimacy to it, an internal world during this. I really related to that. It's hard to describe, but Dinnerstein is right, and I think you need to listen to it in full to experience it. It is very personal and intimate, and you aren't going to find wildly virtuosic writing. And while it has 15 movements with specific individual titles, you don't need to read each one as it plays to enjoy or even understand the music. Daniel Poor even warned about, dictating beyond the evocative titles, how the listener should respond to a new composition. You may find it interesting to listen to it, and when personally moved by what you hear, check out the title of the movement. You might be surprised. Either way, this past year was something every single one of us experienced firsthand. And having a piece of music that reflects nearly every part of society and our collective experience is something worth listening to. Next is an album featuring a full orchestra and the music of Brahms with the Budapest Festival Orchestra and conductor Yvonne Fischer. 
But first, let's acknowledge that very few recordings have come out in the last year. With the worldwide restrictions, it was just basically impossible for most ensembles. In fact, it almost never even happened for this orchestra. The recording engineers made it into Hungary the day before the borders were closed, and they were given special permission to use a venue. It's a recording of the Symphony No. 3 and the Serenade No. 2 by Brahms. At first I thought, as I do sometimes, do we really need another recording of, you know, insert standard repertoire here? Sometimes the answer is absolutely, and that is really the case here. There is something so special about this recording. Textures, colors, and sounds that don't always come through rise to the surface. This was made in September of 2020, months after all concerts were canceled and basically live music essentially was stopped. I imagine the atmosphere while making and recording this music was palpable, but also something we never want to experience again. So the ensemble playing, it's so rich, it is warm. What felt like gentle phrases before now have a sense of urgency and sometimes a weight of like a thousand foot wave. And remember, we did an entire episode this season on the life of Brahms, and Bill Bukowski talked about where this melody comes from in the third movement. Just check out episode 44. I really love the warmth of the solo horn when it takes over this theme, and all the details in the orchestral accompaniment are brought out clearly in this recording. The intensity the orchestra gives in the finale also made me realize, yes, we do need this recording of Brahms' Symphony No. 3. The Serenade No. 2 is dominated by the winds, and they're captured very, very well in this recording. The balance is just right with the strings, and the musicians themselves are also bringing lines in and out seamlessly. It's also fun to listen to these two works in this order because, remember, Brahms took a long time to bring his symphonies to the public. The Symphony No. 3 that starts the album was composed in 1883, and the Serenade No. 2 was written 24 years earlier. I think you'll enjoy this recording. It is a fresh and exciting take on Brahms, and it was made under extraordinary circumstances in 2020. The last album I have for you is the debut album of the Verona Quartet called Diffusion. Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven take up a lot of room in the string quartet world, and I hope this album expands your string quartet horizons. From their liner notes, the quartet says, Through the intimate voice of the string quartet, Diffusion explores a mosaic of folk cultures and their unbridled journey across the globe. The often revelatory and always sublime voices of Janacek, Szymanowski, and Ravel reveal a kaleidoscopic snapshot of cultural migration at the turn of the century. As an ensemble of four nations, the Verona Quartet celebrates this moment in time and the spirit of cross-cultural connection that lays at the heart of their musical message. First things first, Verona Quartet's playing individually and as an ensemble is extraordinary. I would say the quartet is on the younger side, but it sounds like they have been playing together for several decades. The first work is Leos Janacek's String Quartet No. 2 called Intimate Letters. It was composed in 1928, just months before his death. Its name comes from Janacek's unrequited infatuation, or more accurately, obsession with Kamala Stuslova, a much younger and already married woman. 
the work is filled with pulsating rhythms and repeating lines that surround various themes, and there's moments where it all seems to fold inward before bursting back into tempo. It's a work that really arrests your attention. I found myself listening longer than I had time for sometimes. It can suddenly take you in a completely different direction, and I'm just in love with the harmony, rhythm, and how he treats the melodies. The second work is the String Quartet No. 2 by Karol Szymanowski, composed in 1927. This one is also in a world of its own. The texture behind the thematic material is more subdued than the Janacek, and the individual parts come together more often too, but it's nervous, tense, and inquisitive all at the same time. I think this is also a good one for listeners looking to expand their musical horizon. It's approachable and always seems to find its way home, no matter how far out the harmony gets. I also love how Szymanowski can create what sounds like a chamber orchestra of sound with just four players. Since this is one you likely haven't heard before, I won't spoil the end of it for you. The last work on Diffusion is Ravel's String Quartet in F Major, a very popular work and one you have likely heard before. It's also a favorite of mine. When I went to listen to the Ravel, I thought maybe it wouldn't hold up sonically after listening to the musical worlds created by Janacek and Szymanowski. Well, it definitely does hold up, and the Verona Quartet presents it in a way that I think moves beyond previous recordings. A few main things that stick out to me is how the quartet is able to create depth in the sound, like a diorama. The main themes are able to just float on top of the accompanying parts, themselves delicately balanced in front or behind each other dynamically. It's all too easy for dynamics to become kind of homogenous in the accompanying parts in chamber music, but that does not happen here. Also, I think it is easy to try to put too much into Ravel's writing. By that I mean trying to add the kitchen sink of emotions into every line. When you do that, the music can easily lose momentum and phrases become shorter and more labored. Sometimes it's needed, but they also let the music breathe and speak for itself when needed. In the end, sometimes doing less is doing more for the music. The energy, excitement, and propulsion of the final movement really ties the entire album together. They've taken us on a roller coaster of a journey, and in the end, they drop us off right where we started. From rhythm to dynamics and energy, everything is right where it needs to be in Verona Quartet's album Diffusion. So much so, you kind of forget about them entirely when listening. This isn't something you always find in a debut album, and while this one just came out, they are already working on a second. I hope you enjoy this one even half as much as I did. Well, that's it. Four recordings that I think really deserve your attention this summer. Go to the show notes page at classicalbreakdown.org to find out where you can listen and even purchase the albums. And after listening to them, let me know what you think. You can send me an email at classicalbreakdown at weta.org. I hope you enjoy your summer and, of course, catch up on any episodes you missed this past year. Don't forget to leave a review in your podcast app, subscribe, and I will see you for Season 3, which starts on September 7th. I'm John Banther. Thanks for listening to Classical Breakdown from Classical WETA.